So in lesson three, we're going to be talking about water and its solutions. Now, this is coming from the module that talks about chemistry and biology. So again, water is really important because our bodies are made of 70% water. So our focus question here is why do things dissolve in water? Why does so much different stuff dissolve in water and allow for light to exist? Now, the first thing that we want to talk about with this lesson is intermolecular forces. In other words, what are holding objects together? Now, atoms in a covalent bond do not always attract electrons equally, meaning the electrons could be unproportionately shared towards one of the atoms compared to the other. Now, some covalent compounds have atoms that hold onto electrons more tightly. And what this does is it uh, results in a phenomenon known as polarity. So polarity is when we have partial positive and negative charges being pulled towards each one. So in our water molecule, the electrons are pulled toward the oxygen molecule. And as they are more pulled toward the oxygen model, we make a partially negative charge on that oxygen. And since they're more pulled away from these hydrogens, they become po uh, partly positive. This is what we're referring to as polarity. It has a partial charge between it. Just like magnets have charges, a north and a south, and our, our planet has a north and a south pole, these create these fields and almost like uh, intermolecular pool between them. So polarity is the property of having two opposite poles or ends. Now, a magnet is an example of an object that has polarity. So molecules that have an unequal distribution of charges are called polar molecules, and they have oppositely charged regions just like a magnet. So if we take a look at our water molecule, right, which is H2O, these hydrogens are partially positive and these oxygens are partially negative, creating these weak attractional forces between them. So water is a polar molecule, like I just said, and notice that it has a slightly negative end and two slightly positive ends. Again, our hydrogens, which are these two, are H2 and our oxygens up here. So because the electrons are more pulled towards the oxygen, they become more slightly positive. And since those electrons are more attracted to the oxygen, that becomes a partial negative charge. So because of these regions of opposite charge, this causes a weak electrostatic or static attraction between the molecule. These weak attractions between water molecules are called van der Waal forces. And when we're looking at a van der Waal force, we're looking at a partial negative and a partial positive section of atoms being attracted to one another. Now, when they don't work is when these electrons are equally shared and those negative forces uh, repel one another. But in water, where we have that partial positive and negative, it causes an attraction between them. So th these attraction between the molecules are called van der Waals forces which are weak attractional forces that hold these water molecules together. Now, if we take a look at this and we and if we remember, again, it's caused by a slightly positive and negative end. So on one end of the molecule, we have all of these partially negative charges beginning to build up and a partially positive charge on the other end. So where these negative charges line up is with the opposite atom that is partially positive. So in other words, the positive and the negative end, that is what causes the attraction between these two molecules. Now, van der Waal forces are easier to break apart than covalent or ionic bonds, making them ideal for short-term interactions. Now, van der Waal forces act like a molecular Velcro, which allow some animals to actually climb the walls and stick. So unlike covalent bonds, which are more like a molecular knot, these van der Waal forces are able to stick and be peeled away fairly easily.
Now, a gecko uses van der Waal forces between the hair-like structures on the gecko's toes and, the, uh, and allows the gecko to climb surfaces to walk on walls and things like that. So if we zoom in to these gecko's toes, what we'll see is all these little hair-like projections. And what that does is it increases the surface area and increases the uh, van der Waal forces against the wall, the partial positive and negative attraction, which allows them to climb and be very, uh, have almost like sticky fingers. Now for a, for a gecko hanging from a wall or climbing is no great feat. The key to their amazing grip is found in each of its toes. So as we zoom in, what we're beginning to notice is that they first start with these series of rows, which again, creates more surface area. And they are made of tiny hairs called setae. And these hairs are what really create that Velcro appearance by increasing the surface area and causing a stickiness to occur on their feet. And again, the attractions of these fingers are just like the attractions of the water molecules. The partial positive ends of the fingers are attracted to the negative ends of other molecules, and the negative ends of some toes are attracted to the positive ends. So it allows it to stick and Velcro its way up. Now, van der Waal forces um, are an extremely important thing in water too. So to consider how van der Waal forces work in common substances like water, uh, the areas of the slightly positive and negative charges around the water molecule are attracted to the opposite charge of nearby water molecules. This is also what holds water together in almost like drops or teardrops. So again, why water forms droplets, why they can climb, is all due to the relative force of these van der Waal forces. So again, you can see how they form in drops. And you can also see how water is able to almost curve towards that static force. So you can also do this with a, um, a um, balloon and creating electrostagnant by rubbing on your hair. You know, uh, this is also why oil and water repel one another because water is unable to dissolve oil because oil is a nonpolar substance, so they never mix. Now, without van der Waal forces, water molecules would not form droplets. And it is important to understand that van der Waal forces are the attractive force between water molecules, not the forces between the atoms themselves. So again, we are talking about the force that holds individual H2O molecules together, not the force that is holding the hydrogen and the oxygen together. Now, earlier you discovered that water molecules are formed by covalent bonds that link hydrogen atoms or two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen. Now, because the electrons are more strongly attracted to the oxygen atom's nucleus than they do the near, um, nearby hydrogen atom's nucleus, the electrons in the covalent bond with the hydrogen are not equally shared. And this is where we create these things called hydrogen bonds. So there is a hydrogen bond right there, and it is a weak attraction between the partial negative of the oxygen and the partial positive of the hydrogen. Again, these can occur in four different locations from one water molecule. So again, the negative of the oxygen is attracted partially to the positive of the oxygen. Now, electrons will spend more time near the oxygen atom, which creates that partial negative charge of it. So the key here and what van der Waal um, inter interactions kind of do is it creates a bond called the hydrogen bond, which is a weak interaction between hydrogen atoms. It could be a fluorine, it could be an oxygen or a nitrogen atom to form a different molecule. Now, hydrogen bonding is a strong type of van der Waal forces. And many of the unique properties of water arise from its ability to form hydrogen bonds. And water moderates temperature on Earth, it moderates the temperature of living things, it allows water to climb, 
all of these important features are so critical to how humans and all living things on Earth are able to survive. So let's model how these hydrogen bonds are forming between water molecules. Now I can do so in two different ways. I can do so with a ball and stick model or a three-dimensional model. And I'm gonna start with the three-dimensional uh, model here. And if we take a look here, I have two hydrogens that are still bonded to my oxygen. And remember this oxygen has a partial negative and these hydrogens have a partial positive. So to each, to each hydrogen, that is going to be weakly attracted to the negative of the oxygen. And each one of the oxygens is going to be weakly attracted to the hydrogen of that same water molecule. And that can do so to two separate water molecules. And again, it is the partial positive and negative charge right here that is forming this bond. Now, another way is to kind of look at this a little more simpler, which is just simply a ball and stick model. So same thing, we have these partial negatives on the oxygens and these partial positives on the hydrogens. So each oxygen is going to be attracted to these hydrogens in a weak bond. And that oxygen is going to be attracted to the positive nature of our hydrogens in the water molecule as well. So this constant attraction between the hydrogens and oxygens, which again are my hydrogen bonds, is what is holding the water together as well as creating all of the unique properties that are occurring in water. So let's talk about some of these unique properties. So again, the first one is hydrogen bonding. Now hydrogen bonding is when a water molecule is made up of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, a water molecule is polar, meaning it has a charge. And it's a bent shape, resulting in a slightly positive charge on the hydrogen atoms and a slightly negative charge on the oxygen atoms. As a result, it forms hydrogen bonds and the water is called the universal solvent because it can dissolve so many different things of it. In other words, these slightly positive and negative charges are surrounding things like sugar and salt and incorporating them into the water. So water is considered the universal solvent because of these hydrogen bonds and because of the polar nature of the water, which allows them to incorporate more different substances than anything else on the world. Another property that we're going to talk about is adhesion. So adhesion is, is also formed from hydrogen bonds with molecules on the surface. Now this process of capillary action and adhesion, the water is able to stick to surfaces and has the ability to climb. So capillary action is a result of adhesion and it's why water can travel up the stem of plants, water can travel up um, a piece of um, toilet paper or a paper towel and carries the dye to the middle via adhesion. So for example, a really good way to look at this would be just like um, our capillary action here. So if you're a diabetic and test your blood, when you prick your finger, this is why the blood sucks up into those test tubes because it is able to climb up and stick to these edges. The same thing happens over here. If you would use yellow food coloring and blue food coloring and connect them with two paper towels, the colors will actually mix in the middle because of this adhesion being able to stick to it. Now, now another property of water is cohesion. So water is cohesive, meaning the molecules are attracted to each other because of these hydrogen bonds. And again, it all has to do with the polarity and the partial positive of oxygen, excuse me, of hydrogens, and the partial negative of the oxygen. So the positive polarity of the hydrogen atom is attracted to the negative polarity of the oxygen atom. And this attraction creates surface tension, which causes water to form in droplets and allows insects like our water strider to actually walk on the surface. In other words, because that water is sticking together, it creates a film that is able to bear a certain amount of weight, you know, and 
water striders utilize this in order to be a predatorial bug. So another property of water is that actually ice floats. Now, most substances actually get more dense when they freeze. Water is the opposite. Water actually becomes less dense. So liquid water becomes more dense as it cools to four degrees centigrade, yet ice is less dense than its liquid form. As a result, nutrients in the body of water mix because of the changing of water density during the spring and fall. Also, fish can survive in the winter because ice is able to float on the top, which insulates all the water underneath. Again, these properties of um, ice being able to float, cohesion, adhesion, um, universal solvent are all really important features that water is able to do that allows for life to exist. So this leads us to mixtures with water. Now, water, remember, is the universal solvent, which means it can dissolve more things than anything else in the world. So a mixture is a combination of two or more substances in which each substance retains its individual characteristics and properties. In other words, for the most part, they're incorporated, but yet they still hold their same characteristics. So, for example, dumping the sugar in the coffee. The coffee and the sugar are both maintaining their uh, integrity, to speak. A mixture with a uniform composition throughout is called a homogeneous mixture or solution. In other words, both of the two things are equally incorporated within it. So in a solution, you have two parts. You have a solvent, which is a substance in which another substance is dissolved and a solute, which is the substance that is dissolved in the solution. Now remember, when we are talking about a homogeneous solution, these two things are equally distributed, meaning, meaning that they are, you are not going to be able to tell the difference between them. In other words, the sugar is completely dissolved in the coffee, so again, they are equally distributed throughout. Homogeneous means you cannot tell the difference when you make the solution. Solvent is what is doing the dissolving. Solute is what is getting dissolved. Now, another type of mixture is a heterogeneous mixture. And this is the component remains distinct. In other words, the, the two things that are within the solution or the suspension, as they call it, are remaining individual and are not completely incorporated. So sand and water form a heterogeneous mixture called a suspension. And over time, the particles of, st of sand will actually suspend or settle to the bottom. And again, heterogeneous means they're not completely mixed up. Whereas like a, um, if you do sugar and water, if you let that sugar water sit, the sugar and the water are still going to be incorporated equally together. Now, the last type of mixture that we have is what is called the colloid. And this is a heterogeneous mixture in which the particles do not settle out. So, for example, smoke or butter, milk, paint, even blood, the particles never settle out into the bottom. So, the in blood is a colloid that is made up of plasma, made up of cells and other substances, but nothing ever settles out of it. It's always completely suspended within. So if we take a look here and we kind of break this down even further. So let's identify each of the following as either homogeneous or heterogeneous. So sand and sugar. So sand and sugar is going to be a heterogeneous solution, meaning that they're not completely incorporated together and you can separate out the parts. Salt and water, that is going to be a homogeneous meaning that it is going to be completely dissolved within it. Okay, the last one is blood, which is actually a heterogeneous mixture because the parts are still suspended. But remember, this is a colloid, which means that they are never settling out of that heterogeneous mixture. So if we take a look at salt and water here, and we break this down into the solvent and the solute. The solvent would be the thing that is the, doing the dissolving, which in this case is the water. The solute 
is the salt, which is the one that is getting dissolved in. So this is what we're referring to as our solvent and our solute in our mixture. Now, next we're going to be talking about acids and bases. Now, substances that release hydrogen ions, or H+, when they are dissolved in water are called acids. So when you dissolve an acid in water, it releases these H plus ions, which in turn lowers the overall pH of the solution. So when you're getting closer to like uh, lemon, uh, lemon uh, juice or battery acid, it is release, releasing those hydrogen ions. Now substances that will release hydroxide ions or OH when they are dissolved in water are called basics. So a basic solution on the pH scale is anything, anything above 7 to 14. An acid would be anything below 7 to 0. So the measure of concentration of hydrogen in the solution is called the pH. And we create a scale based on this. It goes from 0 to 14. Now, pure water where there are no, where there is an equal amount of hydrogen and uh, hydroxide ions is called water. And it has a pH of 7. Acidic solutions have an abundance of H plus and have pH values that are lower to seven all the way to zero. Now, basic solutions have uh, more OH than H plus and have pH values that are higher than seven. So if we take a look at this scale, right? And we take a look at the solution here, what we'll notice is that anything that falls below from anything less than seven to zero is again is going to have more H plus in that. The stronger you go to while you're zero, the stronger the acid is. And the other way, anything from seven and above to fourteen is considered a basic solution. Again, that has an influx of OH minus in it. Neutral is exactly at seven, and that is pure water. Let's look at a model here that kind of looks at what does it really mean to be an acidic or basic solution. And let's start with a weak acid. So in a weak acid, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be releasing some hydrogen ions. So what this means is there is still some hydrogen ions being released but it is not that high. So it's a weak acid because of that low number of hydrogen ions. Now, when we release many hydrogen ions, this is creating a strong acid. And again, the more hydrogen ions you release, the stronger that solution is going to be. So when we are neutral, that is referring to water. So water has a pH of seven, meaning it has an equal number of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So let's move on to the basic solution. So in a weak base, we are releasing some hydroxide ions. And again, hyd hydroxide ions remember, are OH negative, all right? So just like in a strong acid, a strong base is going to release a large number of these hydroxide ions. So this is what creates a strong acid and a strong base. The stronger your acid, the more H plus ions you're going to be releasing. Water has an equal number of H plus and OH minus or hydroxide ions. As you become more basic, you're creating more hydroxide. So more hydroxide ions means more basic. So in, in terms of our body, most cellular processes occur between the pH of 6.5 and 7.5. So to maintain homeostasis, it is important to control these H plus or hydroxide ions. In our body, we use something that is referred to as a buffer. 
A buffer is a mixture that can react with acids or bases to keep the pH within a relatively particular range. In other words, it's absorbing those H plus ions, it's absorbing those OH ions, and they're lowering the shift in pH in our body because our body reacts well into a very narrow pH range. So if we get out or if we start becoming more acidic, more basic, our body begins to shut down. Buffers are extremely important in keeping homeostasis in our body. So just like in everything, there are jobs that we could potentially look at. So environmental science and protection technician. Are you interested in making sure that people work and live in a clean and safe environment? Environmental science and protection technicians have uh, samples from the environment and analyze them in a laboratory. They use these results to help science and business professionals meet environmental safety standards. So let's summarize what we talked about in this lesson. First of all, water is a polar molecule, meaning that water has a slight charge. So remember, water is H2O. These hydrogens have a slight partial positive and the oxygen has a slight negative, which gives all of the properties of water. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures formed when a solute is dissolved in a solvent. So for example, solvent would be like water dissolving salt. Okay, salt would be the solute, water would be the solvent. Water's property contribute to Earth's uh, suitable or Earth's pretty suitability for life. So things like cohesion, adhesion, universal solvent, um, high specific heat, these are all characteristics of water that allows life to exist. Acids are uh, substances that release hydroxide ions, which again are H plus uh, into the solution. And bases are substances that release hydroxide ions, which are OH minus. And pH is a measure of the concentration of these hydrogen ions in a solution. Remember, zero to seven, this is an acidic solution. The more or the closer that you are to zero, the more acidic you are. For anything above seven is a basic solution and anything at seven is pure water. So hopefully this helps you out with lesson three. Again, this is Mr. O'Brien signing off.